Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome in to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, a service of Care Patrol where everything uh, we do starts with education. And that's how we come to do these contact hours with you is uh, our uh, emphasis on educating those with whom we come in contact about things that may be of value or interest to them. If you're new to us and you're not familiar with Care Patrol, I can tell you that we are an aging care navigation service, sometimes called a placement service. And we essentially are hand holders of people who are either in planning stages or critical stages of needing care. Our services are at no charge as we're paid by the providers in our network. So I'm hoping that makes us appealing to you and your clients and your friends and colleagues when you have a need. We have no fees that we charge. Instead, we're paid by providers. And we do all this because we love it, just like we do the education, because we love it. I've grown to love it. Today's topic is an interesting one that's in the news. You may have seen it. It is the loneliness epidemic, and that has been in the news now for the past week or more. Um, it is a topic that was not suggested by our uh, attendees. Most of ours are, and all of our topics are accredited by the Alabama Board of Social Work, as well as by the Alabama Board of Nursing. We use an online evaluation tool and that tool is password protected. And in that way, we can prove to the Alabama Board of Social Work that this is a live or face-to-face -face contact hour because we give the password at the end. So you have the opportunity to discuss and interact and participate. And that is what they wish to see. And we do encourage discussion. Those of you who've been with us know that we very dearly enjoy it. And I feel very confidently that, that whatever I might have to say today would be enriched and enlivened by your comments, whether you choose to do those out loud by letting me know you want to speak uh, in the chat room or just putting your comment in the chat room. We do welcome your discussion and we count on it, actually. And I think our other attendees who are regular count on hearing from their colleagues. Those of you who have been with us and know that you can watch or experience this without seeing a screen, maybe on your phone or otherwise busy, I'm going to read to you now the evaluation link so that you will have it. Remember, it's password protected, and we give the password at the end. The link is https colon forward slash, forward slash, www.surveymonkey.com, forward slash, lowercase r, forward slash, all uppercase letters, two, N as in Nancy, J, X, seven, six, K. So one more time, the address is always the same except for the last, and that is two, N as in Nancy, J, X, seven, six, K. Thank you so much for being aware of that. I will put the uh, link again in the chat room so that it will appear for those of you who are now with us. We have three objectives today as we discuss the loneliness epidemic. They're fairly broad, uh, but we're going to describe and we hope you'll participate uh, with us as we talk about various accepted definitions of loneliness. And there are quite a few markers of it. Uh, we want to learn the causes and later the physical effects of loneliness on the body. And we want to throughout discuss the U.S. Surgeon General's 
2023 advisory on loneliness. Ms. Woods, we give the password out at the end, and that way we ensure that this is live for everyone. So we will give the password at the end. So I'll ask you all, as, as I mentioned in the opening today, uh, there's been headlines recently about loneliness and the loneliness epidemic. And what headline might you have seen? And it was a fairly common one. What headline would you might have seen in which the Surgeon General recently said the physical equivalents of loneliness on the body are this? Do y'all know what the U.S. Surgeon General equated with loneliness effects on the physical body? Anyone catch that headline? What headline did the U.S. Surgeon General recently make about the physical equivalent of loneliness on the body? I see I've caught y'all off guard this morning. Thank you, Ms. Smith. It's 15 cigarettes a day. Dr. Vivek H. Murthy, who is the current U.S. Surgeon General, told the Harvard Business Review and a number of other publications that loneliness and weak social connections are associated with a reduction in lifespan similar to that caused by smoking 15 cigarettes a day and even greater than that associated with obesity. And Dr. Murthy continued to the review, it's hard to put a price tag on the amount of human suffering people are experiencing right now. In the last few decades, we've just lived through a dramatic pace of change. We move more, we change jobs more often. We are living with technology that has profoundly changed how we interact with each other and how we talk to each other. And you can feel lonely even if you have a lot of people around you because loneliness is about the quality of your connections. And we see that really over time that the reduction of loneliness has been the cause of human action and interaction and organization and government and every other enterprise institution that we enjoy. In fact, Professor Ben Lazar Mijuskovich says that since the dawn of civilization, uh, loneliness is the single strongest motivator for human activity after essential needs. So after we are able to procure shelter and clothing and food and water, we then look next to procure human interaction, social connection. In fact, loneliness is the first negative condition described in human history, which is, of course, the Bible. And in Genesis, God created Eve so that Adam would have a companion. And yet relatively little was written about loneliness in the ensuing centuries. Uh, and in part, Professor Ruben Gateski argues that that is because that the sense of aloneness that we feel in the 21st century was rarely felt when we were living more communally just 100 or 150 years ago. He says that communal ways of living began to be disrupted by the Enlightenment. You're talking, I think, 14th or 15th century. And so even since then, we've had some notion that we are lonely. The author of the U.S. Surgeon General's advisory was Julianne Holt Lundstad. She was the lead author, and she says the evidence has been mounting for decades in terms of documenting the significant consequences to our health 
and well-being, there's been a simultaneous evidence of trends that suggest that we are becoming less socially connected, she said. And simply getting back to normal will not be enough. This is why the advisor was written, and in it, it puts forth a national strategy, which we will discuss later in the hour. I want to ask y'all, and I know this is personal, and it may not be something you wish to answer out loud, but if you have that sort of courage, I suppose, then would you answer, have you ever felt alone in a crowd? And I will tell you that I have not only felt alone in a crowd once, but many times. Frequently, Miss Wright, Miss Helms, yes, for sure, Miss Melton, Miss Thomas, yes. I think. I think we would all answer in the affirmative here, wouldn't we? Certainly, depending on who the others are in the room, says Mrs. Smith. And I think that's really the crux of it, isn't it? Depends on who's in the room and our place in the room and our sense of self. So loneliness, if you wish to define it, is simply an unpleasant emotional response to our perceived isolation. Some of the literature refers to it as social pain. But social pain really is more of a psychological mechanism that motivates us to seek connection over the course of human history. Uh, and the thing about loneliness is it is a perceived lack a perception, a perceived lack of connection and intimacy with others. And it overlaps and yet is very distinct from solitude. Solitude is simply being separate or apart from others, but not separate, excuse me. And not everyone, of course, who experiences solitude feels lonely. Many of us enjoy solitude. We enjoy our time alone, whether that's at home or out in the wild or uh, wherever it may be and how we may spend it, we enjoy it. So loneliness then is subjective, isn't it? And it can be felt even when we're surrounded by other people, as we've all attested. And loneliness can be either short-term or long-term. Long-term clearly would be chronic. And it doesn't matter if you're feeling lonely today, whether you've been feeling lonely for five years or just today, it's just as painful. The causes of loneliness are varied. It could be genetic. It could be cultural. It could be that you've lost some meaningful relationship or you never formed it. it could be that you've lost your job or lost a loved one or lost some part of your identity even. It could be, and this is new to us in the 21st century, an excessive reliance on passive technologies. And loneliness, lest you think otherwise, is self-perpetuating. It's found throughout society. We all experience it at some time or another. Some of us feel it more often. Some of us feel it constantly and chronically. Short-term loneliness can actually have positive effects. It can be motivating. It can increase our focus on something, perhaps finding a, a, a connection. But chronic loneliness has the opposite effect. And it has been correlated through the research with an increase in obesity, substance use disorders, the risk of depression, and I think it's probably a fairly high risk, cardiovascular disease, risk of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, suicidal thoughts and ideation, and for some, unfortunately, the increased risk of death. And at any moment, one in two of us in America are feeling measurable levels of loneliness. Measurable. That doesn't matter if we're introverted or extroverted, young or old, rich or poor. Loneliness affects us all. And all of us have been through a once in a lifetime pandemic 
which took our loneliness and put it in a blender. The reason we don't have more research on loneliness and don't already have a preformed plan and an attack is that loneliness is so subjective as we've discussed. And moreover, there's a stigma about being lonely. So for those of you who said you sometimes feel lonely in a crowd, as I did, how many of you would also say to someone you've just met, I'm really lonely? Or to someone you sort of know, I'm really lonely. We don't admit this to ourselves or others. In fact, we're more likely to believe that we have some psychiatric disorder versus loneliness. There was a book in 1973 by Robert Weiss. It was a seminal work in the study of loneliness, and the title is Loneliness, the Experience of Emotional and Social Isolation. And Mr. Weiss, in his book, divided loneliness into two. He said that there is social loneliness, and this is someone who may experience maybe a lack of a wider social network. So they have maybe a close friend or two, but they don't really have a group that they go to parties with or games with or whatever groups do. And then there are those who are socially lonely who may not feel that they are members of any community or that they have any friends or allies on they can, whom they can rely. In fact, in Great Britain in 2018, there was a study in which 67% of Great Britain folks said they didn't have a friend or an ally they could rely on, 67%. Now, emotional loneliness was the other uh, category of Mr. Weiss, who described that as the lack of deep nurturing relationships which he tied to attachment theory. We won't get into that today. And we know though that people have a need for deep attachments, close friends or family members. And for those of you who've passed the 50 mark as I have and have an empty home, you know that it may be that your spouse is now your closest and dearest friend. We would warn you that uh, when your spouse becomes your only friend, studies show that divorce and infidelity may occur. In 1997, Enrico Di Tommaso and Barry Spinner took Mr. Weiss's work and separated emotional loneliness into romantic loneliness and family loneliness. And then in a 2019 study, it was found that emotional loneliness significantly increased the likelihood of death for older adults who are living alone. But the same study showed there was no increase in mortality for those who had social loneliness. Thomas Wolfe is an essayist. You may know the name. He was from the turn of the 20th century. And in an essay, he stated, the whole conviction of my life now rests upon the belief that loneliness, far from being a rare and curious phenomenon, is the central and inevitable fact of human existence. The whole conviction of my life now rests upon the belief that loneliness, far from being a rare and curious phenomenon, is the central and inevitable fact of human existence. How many of you agree with Thomas Wolfe? Do you agree with Thomas Wolfe, who wrote in the 1930s, that loneliness is a central and inevitable fact of life. Do you agree with Thomas Wolfe that loneliness is a central and inevitable fact of life? Ms. Smith, his idea is quite bleak. 
I agree. I agree, but I don't agree necessarily, Miss Etheridge. What is it? How how would you uh, maybe challenge Mr. Wolf? Um, and, and really, the reason I ask the question is I hope that we get into this as we go along today. So is loneliness an epidemic? That's a strong categorization, is it not? If you were to look at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention definition of epidemic, it is an occurrence of more cases of disease, injury, or other health condition than expected during a particular period presumed to have a common cause or to be related to one another. Now, given that definition, I want to ask, do you all believe that loneliness is an epidemic? Is loneliness occurring in greater number than expected during this period post-pandemic than we would have presumed and which has a common cause? Is loneliness an epidemic? It's hard to know a little because despite the number of people who are, we believe, affected by loneliness, there's really few ways to diagnose it. There's no lab work. There's no x-ray. Uh, it's not like measuring our blood pressure. And it encompasses some factors that are not measurable. So aspects of someone's life that we can record, like marital status or size of household, or maybe to a lesser extent, the size of the social network, is met by the variables of that person in terms of their perception of their network and their loneliness, their perception of how much support they have and their satisfaction in the relationships that they have. And we know that self-reported data will contain inaccuracies because sometimes we simply can't quantify how we're feeling. Ms. Smith continued, I believe it is happening more, but I don't believe it is inevitable either. Well, I hope it's not, I do too. Ms. Mahan, yes, as a Gen Z millennial, I believe so. Because of technology, higher rates of mental illness, such as depression and anxiety. You ladies are uh, pr uh, prescient, I believe is the word. You're seeing the future. So in 1985, the General Social Survey of the United States found that 10% of Americans hadn't discussed important matters with anyone in the last six months. In 2004, 19 years later, that number had risen to 25%. And we attribute that in that period to the constant rise in single person households with increasing rates of divorce and the aging of children, uh, there has been a rise in single person households. And in that rise, and then, then as we retire, we drift away from people. We risk depression and or anxiety, place more uh, weight on our marriage. And we think of ourselves as most surely depressed, not lonely, not, we're not lonely, we're something else, we think. And then in 2020, in October, uh, Harvard did a study in which they found that 36% of Americans reported feeling seriously lonely. So in a matter of, what, 17 years, we rose from 25% of people essentially saying they hadn't had a close confidant in six months to 36% saying the same thing. And then we found that particularly mothers with young children are frequently 25% or almost always 51% lonely. Now, did any of you uh, stay home and raise your young children? And if you did, I wonder if you'd be comfortable reporting to us whether you could agree 
that that is one of the more lonely times in a woman's life, or in some rare cases, a man's life, is spending one's time all day with children and lacking adult, real connection. So young adults in 2020 who were 18 to 25 were found to be very vulnerable to loneliness and over half reported going weeks without anyone asking them how they are doing. Twenty twenty one Cigna surveyed twenty thousand U.S. adults. Almost half reported feeling alone. This is one year later. Forty percent left out. Forty seven percent. One in four feel they are not understood. This is you and me, us. Two in five of us feel that our relationships are not meaningful, and that we are isolated. And the problem, again, with this is that it is perception, it is subjective, and that perception leads us down the rabbit hole as we go further into our sense of loneliness and isolation to where we feel that others are not listening to us or taking us seriously. We feel that others don't make eye contact with us or recognize us or give us validation that they are implicitly or explicitly at times dismissing us, not valuing us, and it reinforces our feeling of isolation and the loneliness and the loneliness. Now, this is truly alarming. In the survey in 2021, it found that while a half felt that they were disconnected overall, among Hispanics, that is 75%, three in four people feeling lonely, measurably lonely. And with Black folks, it's nearly as high, 68%, seven in 10. Women and men are roughly the same, about 60%, so about six in 10. So these numbers can start to conflict if you you add them up, but they come from various different sources. And the point is to show you that the numbers are high, high enough, in fact, to qualify as an epidemic. So from 1990 to 2010, 20 years, the number of Americans who report no close confidants or friends tripled. Before COVID, about 50% of us reported feeling lonely. And we know that this loneliness can damage our bodies and interrupt our lifespan. It was May 2nd of this month, May 2023, that the U.S. Surgeon General released the advisory entitled Our Epidemic of Loneliness and Isolation. And it warns, as I mentioned earlier, that the physical consequences of poor connection can be a 29% increased risk of heart disease, a 32% increased risk of stroke, and a 50% increased risk of developing dementia, and an increased risk of death by 26%. the consequences of poor physical connection. Eric Liu runs Citizen University, which is a Seattle-based nonprofit, and its attempts are to build community within Seattle. And through Mr. Liu's work, he says that he's noted and believes very firmly that a broken heart is physical as well as a social diagnosis. Mr. Liu says, when you are alone and disconnected, there's more stress, there's more inflammation, there's more anxiety, and that has effects not only on the body, but the ways in which we see each other in community and feel connected to one another. So much of the challenge we have right now is a culture problem. He added, that's why I think one of the things that's so important 
about the Surgeon General's report is creating a culture of connection. And this is where you and I begin to come into this. You know, people who are more isolated find their health uh, declining sooner than people who feel connected to others, says Mark Schultz, who was the director of the Harvard study I mentioned earlier. And he added, pay attention, lonely people also live shorter lives. Ms. Smith is asking, do we think these increases are due to the false inclusion that social media provides to so many? I know we are trying to change this idea, but judging from these numbers, not quickly enough, very much, Ms. Smith. I would very much pin this to social media, but you'll see a surprise when we get to that in today's presentation, something I didn't expect. This is a graphic from the Cigna Cigna study, excuse me, that was uh, performed in 2021. And it just shows us that the adults who have ailments compared to those who are not lonely, uh, that difficulty sleeping is the most common condition caused by loneliness. That's odd to me, which is experienced by almost 24% of adults compared to 14% who are not lonely. Weight problems increased by... 15% to 10%. Uh, Substance use increases, almost triples. Neurological disorders are 9% to 2%. And kidney or urologic problems, 8% to 5%. And so you can see that loneliness has a measurable effect on our body and on our health. And the study by the American Journal of Public Health stated that loneliness is associated with higher healthcare utilization in older adults, but healthcare workers are not trained to consider loneliness as part of the reason for the visit. Instead, they look at other illnesses. And studies suggest, and part of this uh, Surgeon General's advisory would be uh, in favor of having us train our physicians and clinicians to consider loneliness as a factor when seeing all kinds of patients and not just the elderly or those who are at high risk because they live alone or for other reasons. In fact, according to the Surgeon General, we have to embed social connections into our society. And this would include things like having doctors make loneliness question part of an annual checkup. And then once finding that a patient is lonely, connecting them with community resources that seek to alleviate that. And so I wonder, y'all, even though I've, I've said it in some way, I, I, there's, a, there's something specific I'm looking for. How, how does loneliness affect the body? So, I mean, we've seen that it affects us in terms of our, our heart, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, uh, obesity, substance use disorder, depression. So we know that loneliness affects us in that way, but how does that come about? What's the, what's the, what generates these uh, ill effects. What does loneliness do? Uh, Ms. Taylor says loneliness has always been there, but increased when COVID hit. I agree. COVID brought about human separation, causing us to fear one another on a different level. That's very insightful. Causing us to fear one another on a different level because we are separated, and that is the human tendency. Really interesting, Ms. Taylor. Social anxiety and kids, you're right. How does loneliness affect the body? Well, loneliness is associated or being alone is associated with hypervigilance. The same as PTSD, which we discussed in the past, the same as complicated grief, which we discussed in the past, hypervigilance. This is why there is disrupted sleep and the release of the stress hormones during this hypervigilance, hypervigilance, excuse me, 
uh, is releases the cortisol that causes us to have a racing heart and muscle tension and quickness of breath and are prepared and on alert for something. Now, stress, we know, we've discussed many times here, and I'm sure you know in your own practices, that stress leads to higher levels of inflammation. And this leads to a higher risk then of cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and diabetes. And the increase in mortality when studying loneliness is seeing the immune system's response to stress. And if we can see this, perhaps we can see how stress and loneliness contribute to so many diseases and disorders. Stress is the answer I was looking for. Now, there was another recent study of elderly folks. And as we know, the elderly, all of us as we age, decrease in our immune function. And many of the elderly are also likely to identify as lonely. And so someone who is already having an immune, uh, you know, immune, immuno, immunocompromised sort of system due to simple aging is even more vulnerable and compromised because of the stress hormones and because of the hypervigilance and because of the loneliness, which places us there. And so we have an uncompromised uncom population of the elderly who are growing increasingly lonely, and we know this leads to health complications. And we see that those people who had stress early and persistently throughout life are even more subject to be compromised. The U.S. Health and Retirement Study took place from 1998 to 2010. It analyzed 8,382 men and women who were 65 and older. They underwent biennial assessments targeting their loneliness and depression. And the researchers over that 12 year period compared the effects on mortality of being lonely and connected loneliness with accelerated cognitive decline. And then a 2022 paper from Johns Hopkins found the same, that socially isolated older adults have a higher chance of developing dementia than their peers. And Thomas Kudjo, who was one of the authors of that study at Johns Hopkins said, social connections matter for our cognitive health and the risk of social isolation is potentially modifiable for older adults. So, what might be, and this is where some of you have already hit answers for us today, what might be significant contributing factor or factors to the rise in reported levels of loneliness? I think we've seen so far that we've identified COVID as one. Uh, we've identified social media, uh, and, and these will be the two uh, or some of what we'll discuss. There, Olds and Schwartz, uh, the authors of The Lonely American, stated in 2009 that we were a more lonely America than in the past, even though we devote more technology and resources to communication than ever. This technology has revolutionized how we interact and has disrupted how we interact and we know if we have children or witness them in public, that they're the most avid users of social media. Fully 91% of smartphone owners 18 to 29 in a study with the Pew Research Center looked at their phone within the period of that study compared to 55% of those 50 and older. And here's what I said earlier, you might find something surprising about social media. One thing is that loneliness may decrease while happiness and satisfaction may increase as a function of image-based social media. Now, image-based would be things like uh, Snapchat, 
or um, uh, what do the kids like now? TikTok. These are image based, whereas text based would be Twitter. Uh, and the observed effects may be due to the enhanced intimacy of seeing people, feeling connection because visually you have that uh, connection. But in truth, it's really hard to know if this has borne out. Remember, this was written in 2009, this, this uh, data. Uh, and what we see then is new social platforms come and go so frequently that it's hard to gather data on them before they disappear. But one of the leaders in this field, Dr. Jacqueline Olds wrote that the important first step about talking about loneliness should not be online. It should be person to person. And Ms. Polk is asking, I wonder if the competitive culture being pushed contributes to it. Instead of working as a team and connecting with others, we are encouraged to have an every man for himself mindset in order to climb the ranks. It's very true, Ms. Polk. We talked about this a couple of, uh, back in April in our ethics course, which is on YouTube, when we talked about cultural differences. And the United States is, is the country that is the most sort of individualistic of all countries in the nation. And it is true that we push ourselves as individuals. We're all looking out to be the best. We all want to rise to the top. And naturally there is competition. I think what happens though with, with my own children, just an observation, with social media, even image-based, is FOMO, fear of missing out. In the sense that these images of people laughing and having fun were staged in the midst of what might have otherwise been a dull afternoon. But that image says to the, the viewer, I wasn't a part of that, I wasn't included, I don't have a connection. And that I think is where the issue uh, is, at least it was and experientially for my own family. So across age groups, people are spending less time with each other in person. We know this, and it's most pronounced in young people aged 15 to 24. This generation of kids has 70% less social interaction than the prior generation, 70%. And a lot of young people will use social media as a replacement for in-person relationships. And these, as we know, are lower quality connections. Um, and then for some kids, being online has been a way to find a community. And I would go back to cultural diversity. If we look at the rise in the acceptance of LGBTQ kids and, and adults, as well as trans kids and adults, I mean, we see that this was really, I think, born in large part of social media and the ability of all these individuals out there in the world who felt alone and lonely to find a community and a voice and begin to speak for themselves because of that community. So it's not all bad. Uh, and for some kids, it's you know mostly good, but we just need as a society to protect against elements of technology and social media that maximize the time we spend online. And otherwise they're sort of self-feeding. We spend more and more time because we get those, that rush of dopamine from seeing these images. Chris said, who's a data scientist said, that, I'm sorry, Chris said, said that social media was like a nuclear bomb on teen life. And I don't think there's anything in recent memory or even distant history that has changed the way teens socialize as much as social media. Ms. Taylor said, some people feel it is safer to be home alone than to go out and enjoy themselves, fearing that they may not make it back home. Violence is increased with no place being safe. I, I appreciate that you feel that way, Ms. Taylor, and I'm, I'm Really very sorry that you feel that way and I hope it doesn't inhibit you too much. So let me ask y'all, if loneliness is invisible, how do we see it? What do we look for? Someone came into your clinic 
or office or practice, how would you know? What signs would you look for? How would you determine that they were lonely? Well, some of the more readily available signs, uh, and Ms. Wright says it's very close to depression. Most people, most of us know when our sense of solitude sitting by the park has turned into a little bit of loneliness. We may feel like we need to get up and do something. We may look around the park and feel that all the people walking together in tandem are more connected than we. We may believe that they wouldn't want us to be their friend. They don't have our interest in mind. It will cause us to withdraw. We may become quiet. And then in their clinic, you may find that someone starts presenting with multiple infections, chronic infections more often. You may see that someone gains weight because of their food addiction or substance abuse, alcohol addiction. Uh, you may see them feel as a little bit like Ms. Taylor, that getting out will be energy depleting. But in fact, and I would say to you, Ms. Taylor, it might be energizing. Uh, and then we will often see that people will become irritable over time and may lash out. And that's unfortunate because it places them even further isolated. So some solutions then might be, because we like to hit on those. And this is from a Buffalo social psychologist whose name is Shira, I hope I'm saying it correctly, Gabriel. Ms. Gabriel said that we get the feeling of community being with other people, even people who are strangers. It's really important for us for it to have a sense of social connection and for a sense of well-being. And in a sense, that life is meaningful. People underestimate the degree to which this broader sense of social connection can lead to well-being. And what she says, Ms. Gabriel says, is that we can find antidotes to loneliness in simple places, regular interactions with folks who we pass in daily life. These are called weak connections. This might be the person at the convenience store that you stop every day on the way or home from work. You exchange pleasantries. This is important. In fact, these kind of interactions keep us grounded and not lonely. Uh, this, and one of the reasons that we said we would discuss is the rise of loneliness and related to COVID is remote work. I've worked remotely since 2007, I think. And I can tell you, it's very difficult when you don't have an office of colleagues with whom to interact on a daily basis. So you really have to make an effort to get out of the house and have those, if nothing else, weak connections. So you also have to do things like plan outings. And the way that I like to do this, uh, and, the, and the thing that I want to reintroduce to you, and I've said this many times in our seminars, meetup.com. Go to meetup.com and fill out a profile and put down all of the activities and hobbies and pastimes that you enjoy. And then weekly, you'll get an email with all of the opportunities for you to join a community, a group, a meetup already formed. And this would be an ideal way for you to both practice self-care in terms of doing a habit or pastime as well as combating the loneliness that you may be feeling. She says, Ms. Gabriel says, most people underestimate how much other people want to talk and be friends. This is from the World Health Organization, which also recognizes that loneliness is an epidemic. And they say, here's what you do if you feel socially isolated, get in touch, call someone on the phone or text them. Do things you enjoy, like spending time outdoors or whittling. And then reach out to local services like Meetup 
www.thepeopleshow.com or church groups or others. About how many hours would y'all suppose it takes to make a good friend with someone? How many hours would you suppose it takes to make a good friend with someone? How many hours would you think it takes to make good friends with someone? Well, Richard Weisbord, who is also a Harvard psychologist, found that it takes about 30 hours spent together to make a casual friend and about 50 hours to make a general friend about 140 hours spent together to make a close friend and about 300 to make a best friend. And so, I mean, this involves, and the point is that, that it involves you. Combating your own loneliness involves you willing to invest this time with someone you may identify in the future and how much time you invest depends on how close you want to be. But what I would suggest to many people, and I bet you all on this call know this to be true, is that if you're lonely and you're able, you may find that a pet enriches your life greatly. Uh, and it may give you excuses to interact with others, to go to a dog park or to re-engage with an old friend or to text or put something on social media that draws people in. Uh, now, therapy and antidepressants work, but I think we can find other means uh, before we get to that point to combat our own loneliness. Ms. Phipps says there's a book called Alone Together by Sherry Turkle, which talks about social media technology and in-person interactions. Thank you, Ms. Phipps. Alone Together by Sherry Turkle. Y'all check it out. And I will as well. Psychologists, psychiatrists, and others know, and I'm just putting this here because we've said this so many times in these CEUs, mindfulness can make a marked, measurable, and physiological demonstrable improvement in your attention, well-being, inflammatory processes, and ability to find solitude without loneliness. We have a few different CEUs on mindfulness on YouTube. Ms. Gabriel finishes her thought by saying that if you're looking to combat loneliness in yourself, listen to yourself. Ask yourself what makes you happy and when do you feel your best? And when you do these things, she says, when you find these answers, Try to get more of that, which will again lead you naturally to human connection. Now, there are some technological solutions. So oddly, and I said this earlier, technology is both, a, I believe, a root cause of our growing and burgeoning loneliness epidemic, but it also has some opportunities to help us. There are mindfulness apps. My wife has several, and I think she finds them very helpful. There are apps that say, hey, you spent too much time online today. There are apps like meetup.com. And then there's AI-related technologies. You may know that in many dementia units now, we will find robotic cats and dogs who interact with residents. And this has been found and shown to be a cure to the loneliness that those community residents feel. So what might be in a national strategy to combat loneliness? I bet you can determine it. In 2021, 126 U.S. mayors were upholed and they were already trying to combat the effects of COVID and they found that mental health issues like loneliness and trauma like loneliness topped their concerns about the potential long-term effects of COVID. And many cities then began programs to direct residents to community events, to community health services. Chicago tripled mental health funding. 
Um, and San Francisco found that it could create a program called Community Living in which it matched seniors and people with disabilities to employment and support services. And fully 93% of these seniors and people with disabilities felt less isolated when they were connected. 84% now know their neighbors and 99% felt healthier. Midland, Michigan does something similar. Cities across the nation. Now, there are a lot of face-to-face -face and digital tools we can use and interventions, community support groups, certainly befriending, Cognitive behavioral therapy can help with loneliness because again, it is subjective. And then we want to make physical infrastructure changes too, as well as legal changes. This is what the Surgeon General advised. Um, now we want to educate, first of all, how loneliness changes our perceptions. We wanna teach techniques to reframe these perceptions, which are negative, where mindfulness comes in. We want to inform people that loneliness is widespread. One in two people feel it. You should not be ashamed about it. And then we want to have digital platforms, local organizations involved. We want schools to connect parents to one another again. We want to make sure that children have a trusting relationship with a safe school adult. We want colleges to create community again. We want senior centers to try and reach out to young people in workplaces to find healthy ways to do team building. And you might go to your supervisor and say, hey, can we get a softball team or a volleyball team or a bowling team? Can we do something to build team? The U.S. Surgeon General advised three, six pillars, strengthening our social infrastructure with parks, libraries, and public programs, enacting public policy that is pro-connection, mobilizing the health sector and things like asking about loneliness, reforming the digital environment so that we critically evaluate our relationship to and with technology as a society, deepening our knowledge of loneliness through more research. Again, there's been very little and cultivating these cultures across the divide of connection. Dr. Vivek Murthy ends uh, his review or interview with the Harvard Business Review in this way. Loneliness acts like a hunger or a thirst, a signal. Our body sends us when we need something for survival. It's when it persists that it becomes harmful. We have an opportunity and an obligation to make the same investments in addressing social connection that we have made in addressing tobacco use, obesity, and the addiction crisis, Murti said in the advisory. We are called to build a movement to mend the social fabric of our nation. It will take all of us, individuals and families, schools and workplaces, healthcare and public health systems, technology companies, governments, faith organizations, and communities working together to destigmatize loneliness and change our cultural and policy response to it. That is our course for today, the loneliness epidemic. Our code word is SMILE, and that's in all caps, S-M-I-L-E, SMILE, in all caps is today's code word, password, for the evaluation, which is at https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters to n as in Nancy J X seven. 6K. That's our evaluation link. Our code word or password again is SMILE, all capital letters, SMILE. And this is what I would suggest to you. If you're feeling lonely, make small changes. 
Try and smile when you pass people. In fact, make a game of it. See who you can get to smile back. That little rush may bump you out of your loneliness. And if you get enough little rushes, it may keep you from loneliness. Will you please put the link in the chat? Yes, I will. Here it is. And the password I'm putting into the chat as well. Smile, all capital letters. So again, the link is HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www dot survey monkey dot com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase two n as in nancy j x seven six k so y'all i hope you have a great week join us on friday of this week when we will address medicare for all this is not Medicare Advantage, although it includes it. This is Medicare for All, which is what uh, uh, the presidential, some of the presidential candidates had talked about in the last cycle, particularly Bernie uh, Sanders. So it was Bernie Sanders who, who talked about Medicare for All. And we're going to look at what would a single payer health care system look like for the United States. So Friday is Medicare for all. Please join us. Thank you all for your kind words. And, and, and uh, I thank you for letting me know you enjoy these. I enjoy doing them. I hope you'll come back and I hope you'll remember us when someone mentions to you that they have a friend or a loved one that's in need of ideas for senior living. We'd love to help them and we're free.